Hello YouTube. Now, um, modal logic has had an enormous amount of influence on contemporary analytic philosophy. Um, if you don't know modal logic, then you'll be missing out on a whole bunch of fascinating philosophical work. But the development of modal logic has had its ups and downs, and there are philosophers who regard or did regard the whole enterprise as completely misguided. And without doubt, the most prominent critic was W. V. O. Quine, this man here. I'm assuming you know who this guy is. If not, you're probably in the wrong place. Uh, Quine was deeply, deeply critical of modal logic in general, and we'll be examining some of his objections in this little series. But firstly, I need to give some historical background. So, um, modal logic has had quite a long history. You can go back thousands of years and find logicians trying to formalise uh, notions of possibility and necessity. Um, but throughout that time, there have been those who have found the notion of modality to be kind of vague and wishy-washy. Uh, you know, there doesn't seem to be any way of empirically verifying what's possible, what's necessary, what's contingent, and so on. Um, now, in the first part of the 20th century, positivism was all the rage, and the positivists were very, very concerned with empirical verification. Metaphysics in general was not in high regard, uh, modality in, in particular wasn't either. It was in this sort of atmosphere, around the 1910s, 1920s, when C.I. Lewis uh, first began developing what would become modern modal logic. This is C.I. Lewis here. Um, now, Lewis's concern wasn't so much with modality. He was interested in a, uh, a rather famous problem with conditionals, known as the paradoxes of material implication. And uh, I need to just sort of explain this to explain his, his uh, motivations there. So, in our standard propositional logic, we define the conditional as being false only if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Uh, here's the truth table for the conditional. Um, and this is called the material conditional, or material implication. Uh, material implication is just truth functional. The truth of the whole conditional is uh, a truth, is, is a, a function of the truth of its parts. So as long as you have either a false antecedent or a true consequent, then you have a true conditional. Nothing else matters, just the truth value of the parts just the truth value, nothing else matters. Now uh, that is totally fine as a purely formal definition, but Lewis felt that it didn't really accord with our everyday use of conditional statements, with our everyday notion of implication. Um, you know, all the other operators like not, and, uh, or, all those other operators, they're totally intuitive. The formal definitions at least intuitively match the everyday use. Uh, but with material implication, it's not really so clear that it actually captures implication as we use it. It, it gives some very strange results. Um, two in particular bothered Lewis. So, uh, the first one uh, is if P then if Q then P. And basically what this tells us is that if a proposition is true, then anything implies it. So, for example, it's true that Frank Zappa was a musician. Um, so he might say uh, this, for example. If Frank Zappa was a musician, P, then if the moon is made of cheese, then Frank Zappa was a musician. Uh, so if P, then if Q, then P. Uh, obviously Frank Zappa was a musician, um, so by modus ponens we can, we can derive if the moon is made of cheese, then Frank Zappa was a musician. So that conditional there is true. But that seems very, very counterintuitive. Uh, another problematic inference for Lewis was, if not P, then if P, then Q. And this simply says that if a proposition is false, then it implies anything. And, you know, you can try that again. I mean, take if the moon is made of cheese. Well, that's a false proposition. So 
on material on material implication that statement implies anything at all okay so any conditional that you uh, of which this is the antecedent would be a true conditional now lewis wanted to define a notion of implication that's more in line with our intuitive ideas uh, and this is essentially what he did we have this uh, new connective for strict implication and that's the connective there it's sort of like a, a three with a line before it um, and uh, strict implication the way strict implication works is um, it's essentially all you do is just attach a necessity operator to the front of the material conditional so just take the material conditional and put necessarily in front of it so um, if p then q under strict implication is defined as necessarily if p then q in material implication so in this case um, it's true that Frank Zappa was a musician. Is it necessarily true that if the moon is made of cheese, then Frank Zappa was a musician? Well, obviously not. It could have been the case uh, that um, you know uh, the moon be made of cheese, but Frank Zappa be a research chemist instead. So that conditional is rendered false on strict implication. On the other hand, for an example of a of a conditional which would be true on strict implication um, take if Frank Zappa wrote Zuta Lures then Frank Zappa was a musician well that seems to be totally true uh, totally reasonable because Zuta Lures is a, a music album so if Frank Zappa wrote that then he was surely some sort of musician even if he ne never did any kind of music in his life surely that indeed is necessarily true now there are many questions to be asked about strict implication and it's very controversial whether it does the job that Lewis wanted it to do. But all that's relevant here is that um, Lewis developed this idea, this idea of strict implication, and in doing so he had to invoke the notion of modality, because you're dealing, with, you're dealing now with necessity and possibility and those ideas. And having introduced the notion of modality, we need to understand how it behaves logically. And in uh, 1932, uh, Lewis proposed five different systems, S1 through to S5. If you've been watching my series on modal logic, we've already encountered S4 and S5, and I'll be discussing some of the others quite soon. So that was pretty much the birth of modern modal logic. This is where modern modal logic came from. It came from this problem of the conditional and uh, Lewis's attempt to solve it. However, it's worth pointing out that at this time, and for at least a couple of decades afterwards, modal logic wasn't in very good shape at all. So it, it was faced with a number of problems. So uh, the first one is, Lewis developed five systems, but that simply raises the question of, which system is the right one? Five systems of modal logic mean there are five ways of interpreting just what strict implication amounts to. Uh, and, you know, we can't understand necessarily if p then q unless we understand how necessarily behaves unless we understand what necessarily means and we can't understand what necessarily means until we know which logic is the right logic of modality um, so that was a problem and it didn't help that it's fairly easy to construct more systems beyond those first five now in some cases it's fairly easy to say just what a logic of modality should include. So, for example, we probably want to say that if something is necessary, then, it's, then it is the case. So, if necessarily P, then P. A modal logic should probably include that. Uh, another one it should probably include is if P, then possibly P. We want to say that if something is the case, then it's possible. So, to some extent, you know, we can say, we, we can say what a modal logic should what sort of formulas a modal logic should allow to be derivable. Um, but you don't have to explore modal logic very deeply before you start to encounter more problematic formulas. So just take something simple, like the uh, characteristic formula of S5, if possibly P, then necessarily possibly P. What on earth does it mean to say that something is necessarily possible? I mean, what 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 is that? 
This is not a, a difficult formula, this is quite a common formula, but it's, it's very difficult to say just what it means. Um, we don't really know how to interpret this. And, and that, as I say, is quite a simple case. If you're doing modal logic, then you can encounter any, any kind of string of, of operators. You might encounter necessarily, 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 possibly, possibly, necessarily, p. Well, what the hell does that mean? Um, so we have the problem that modal formulas just don't seem to make any sense. With every other logical symbol, you can mix, mix them up any way you want. And it might take you some time, but you can apply simple rules to figure out what it is they mean. You know, we have a good understanding of how the normal logical connectives behave. And we can quite easily stipulate what rules we should, we should go for. Um, but the same can't really be said of modal operators. Now, perhaps worse, Lewis didn't provide a semantics for his logic. So validity is often defined in terms of interpretations. We say that some argument is valid if and only if all the interpretations that make the premises true also make the conclusion true. But without a semantics, we can't say what an interpretation is. So we can't give validity in these terms. We also can't provide counterexamples to invalid arguments. We can't give soundness and completeness proofs, and so on. Um, so modal logic had serious problems. There were a number of disparate systems. Nobody had any idea what the modal formulas really meant, and nobody had even provided a semantics for these logics. So how can something so poorly understood be philosophically useful? Well, uh, a real revolution in modal logic came in the sort of late 50s, early 60s, when the work of people um, like Sal Kripke led to modern possible world semantics. Um, possible world semantics, to a large degree, uh, solved these problems, as you'll be aware if, if you've been watching my modal logic videos. Um, but before, before the development of possible world semantics, there was a great deal of scepticism about modal logic, uh, and rightly so. Rightly so. Now, Quine's criticisms, at least initially, occurred before possible world semantics was fully developed. Uh, there are those who think that we can use possible world semantics to answer Quine's challenges. Um, Quine himself wasn't at all persuaded by that. But uh, the point is, just bear in mind as I explain his criticisms, that they came before the possible world's revolution. And then we'll maybe, maybe I'll sort of explore how you might use possible world semantics to answer some of them. Okay, so that's, that's just a bit of the historical background there. I hope that was useful. And um, we'll, uh, we'll explore Quine's criticisms themselves in some later videos. Thanks for watching. Bye.